In Genesis 26, 18, it tells us Isaac dug again the wells of Abraham. everybody to Revival Radio TV. I'm Gene Bailey. Glad you're here. Well, today you're in for a treat. I say that because this is my generation stuff that I'm so excited we get to dive into. Special guest today, Rebecca Freelander. Thanks, Rebecca, for coming back. Oh, thanks for having me. You know, some of our most favorite programs out there were on the Celtic Revivals and everything that you did. Yeah, well, you've done something else. And we dove into these pioneers mm. of Christian music back in the 70s, the 60s and the 70s, actually. Uh, so what made you want to d jump into this and find out about all these guys? Uh, well, as a filmmaker, I was working on another television program and just happened to interview several of these pioneers of Christian music, the people who were doing music back in the 60s, 70s. And I, I was struck by the wealth of wisdom that they carried. And I was like, man, I need to capture this to share yeah. this with my generation. Um, being a singer songwriter myself, I was like, wow, I just want to sit at the feet of these people. This is amazing. And so uh, I did like a series of road trips to go around the country and interview 12 of the pioneers of Christian music. And so what makes these people really interesting is they were revivalists of their time. Right. And so during the Jesus movement, which was this, this mass revival that took place around the world and all these people were getting saved, it carried a sound that yeah. radically affected their generation and the generations following. And so what I discovered is that the Christian music that we enjoy today, you know, the worship movement, Chris Tomlin, Hillsong, yep. Jesus Culture, none of that would have happened unless this, this group of just singer songwriter people, these pioneers were passionate to go after the Lord in their generation. Yeah. And then what I discovered was that these people didn't just go after the Lord in that moment, but they ended up ministering for decades and interviewing, uh, impacting like millions of people. So you're world. saying they, you're saying they spoke to the next generation. Expand on what you mean by that. Sure. Well, I, I went to some friends of mine who were singer songwriters and wanted to use their gifts for the Lord. And I just sat down with them and I said, hey, if you could talk with some veteran Christian artists and ask them anything about music, what would you ask them? And they were like, oh, we would love to do that. Here's our questions, but we don't really think anyone cares what we have to say. Mm. And then I went to the pioneers of Christian music and I talked with several of them and I said, hey, would you be interested in responding to some questions from young gen musicians? And they said, yeah, but we don't think anyone cares to hear what we have to say. Wow. And I thought, what a great opportunity to be yeah. a bridge builder yeah. and connect the generations and, and actually glean from the wisdom of these elders and then speak directly to the hearts of the next generation. And so really I sat down and interviewed a bunch of these young artists on film and I took those questions to 12 of the pioneers of Christian music and they responded to them. And they were deep questions that really spoke to the heart. But you just didn't set up an interview and ask them questions you actually spent time with them. Mm. What was that like? Oh, it was life-changing. How so? How was it life-changing? Well, 12 of these people, for instance, um, you know, think of p people like uh, Second Chapter of Acts and Keith Green and Randy Stonehill. I just reached out to them. Some of them I knew already from different right. connections. Um, and people like Melody Green and was like, hey, you know, would you be willing to do an interview? And some of them said, yeah, just come and stay at our home for a couple of days. Wow, that's awesome. And, and we just want to spend time with you. And then, yeah, we'll do interviews too. All right, so let me, I want to dive. I mean, we've got a bunch to cover here. I want to dive into this first one. Uh, second chapter of Acts, you know, these are people's favorites. I know my good friend Mylon Lefevre got saved in a uh, second chapter of Acts concert. Second chapter of Acts, what was it like with them? Well, they were a band in, that started in the 70s, and they were a massive part of, like, the Jesus movement culture, this whole revival music era that right. was going on. And I remember listening to them when I was a little girl because they were my mom's favorite group, you know, sure. listening to them on vinyl and running around the living room to their music. So I reached out to one of the members of the band, 
And, and really, even before I reached out, I wanted to see, just being really honest, I wanted to see if, if they were legit, you know? Yeah, sure. Like, me and my generation going, I want to talk to, like, a, a Jesus movement pioneer, but I kind of want to know if they're the real deal. Right. So I went to a concert that Annie Herring from, from Second Chapter of Acts was doing and um, went to her concert, and she was singing one of her songs, and on stage... I saw tears streaming down her face. And yeah. I just realized right. she's not just going through the motions. Even right. after decades and thousands of concerts, this is so real to her. And it made me want to meet her all the more. And so when I started doing um, interviews, I, I reached out to her and she said, yes, why don't you just come and spend the night in our home in Colorado? And so I met with them and I found out that her husband prays with her every concert they do before she goes on the stage and says, God, help this song be as real to Annie as the first time she played it. And so really God was answering that prayer and making right. it real to right. me. And then I just got to sat, sit with her and ask her all of these questions as she shared her heart. He takes things that are impossible and opens the doors. Lay your heart out before the Lord and just say, you know, I don't get it, but I cannot shake. I cannot shake what I have inside of me. So come and ignite it in me. Come and breathe upon me fresh today so that I can not just procure your blessing, but I want to live your life through me. Just sit down and just sing the first words that come out of your mouth. Just sing it. Doesn't matter. Okay. So I sat down and I got, he loves me. It didn't rhyme. It didn't do anything like I thought it would do, but it expressed my heart. He loves me. It's the first song I received from the Lord. What you are doing is, is it's like a prophecy. It comes out when you do it. What I do is just sit there, play, play, and then a song comes out. I remember just, just one more quick story that was life-changing. When I was in her home, I, was, I, I remember I was just having a quiet moment with the Lord after spending some time with her. And the Lord just gave me this word and he said, these are my cathedrals. Right. And I thought, okay, what is the cathedral? Why is that important? And I began to think cathedrals, they're these beautiful places of worship from a past generation. Right. You know, but nobody goes into a cathedral and says, oh, this is outdated. Right. Or this is, you know, not something interesting to us. They go into a cathedral and they go, wow. And, and I realized that, that Annie Herring and all of these pioneers of Christian music, like they represent... A, a pattern of worship and of beauty yeah. from their generation. And it may not look exactly like how we would do it today, but the effect is, is still there and it's still amazing. Well, and, and I remember uh, the concerts and really it, it was a very moving. And I was a teenager, I guess, still probably at that point. But the uh, the reality is, I mean, it was real. And, mm. you know, everybody talks about your generation really want to make sure it was real. Well, that, that was our generation too. We were like, yeah, seriously? But, you know, they they tapped into something that the rest of the world didn't have. So, and then they were putting it in music that we were we were drawn to. So, I mean, it really, it was really an amazing, an amazing season of worship. Uh, I, I want to, one of my, I have lots of fun friends in Christian music, but Randy Stonehill, uh, now he's a riot, but he, tell me about Randy. What did you learn from Randy? Randy is amazing because he's kind of like this folk rocker guy yep. and guitarist. And he can be super hilarious and funny and cracking jokes and then be real serious and just yeah. get real hardcore. And he shared just some real intimate moments of his journey as I was filming him. And 
just even a moment where he said, you know, you know, God, I don't really want to deal with all these church people. I just want to go out and play my music, you know, because yeah. back in the day, I mean, there was persecution for doing oh, was, contemporary he, listen, music. I remember when drums in the church was not a good thing. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they would a, go out, you know, they'd get shut out yeah. from churches. They, and, and Randy was real honest. He's like, I don't want to deal with this stuff. Yeah. And, and God just spoke to him and said, yeah, you can go out and just do your own thing in music and you might have some measure of success, but you will never experience the peace and the fulfillment of doing what I've called you to do. Yeah. And he began to realize, whoa, this isn't just music, this is a calling. And and all of these guys really talk about that, how you know it's so important to find what God has called you to do. Right. Rather than just going out and doing what you want to do. And and that in itself was a real valuable takeaway. Do you think do you think this era, and, and I'm not in any way putting down Christian music today, but do you think they had an insight into something that maybe is missing today or not as well exposed? Just because of, you know, the growth of contemporary Christian music back then just kind of really exploded on the scene and it brought in so many different aspects of it. Do you think they, they saw something or knew something we don't know necessarily in mass today? Well, one of the questions from the young artist was, how do you keep your ministry pure? Mm. with the pressures of the industry, because right. no doubt there are a lot of pressures when you really get into it. And and these guys just, I mean, basically they were doing it when it wasn't popular. Right. So that kind of, right. they were doing it as missionaries, really, without support. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so right. um, they really responded. And I think the authenticity and the purity that came through some of that early music can be felt. Right. Uh, because you weren't writing for radio. No. You weren't writing for a platform. You were doing what God called you to do with integrity because you believe he was calling you to do it. Yeah. And Amen. we let the chips fall. And Amen. I think that these guys carried that a lot. I think so too. All right, some of my favorites here, Keith and Melody Green. You know, I mean, this guy tore up the piano. And you know, you can still find stuff on YouTube and, and other other channels that you can hear uh, of what they did. But Keith Green was an amazing, uh, you know, you called earlier before we started recording, uh, revivalist. He really was. He really fits that bill of being a revivalist. What he like? captured the heart of his generation and he was so passionate just to see God show up. Like that's what he wanted. He wasn't into the fame, although he really did kind of get to celebrity status, I think, within that community of that time. Right. Um, but I mean, these guys, he would pack out stadiums. You know, these guys were like, such a force for God that they right. were impacting people. And he would say things that were not comfortable. Right. And he would poke people where it was uncomfortable for them. Well, I remember, and I was telling you, I was in a Keith Green concert in Washington, D.C. area, uh, Washington for Jesus in the 70s. And he was, and it was exactly that, a packed out stadium. And he just came out and put everybody in their place. And what are you looking for? And I remember feeling so convicted, you know, because I just came to hear the the concert and good music, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, he's right! I need to get I need to get this right and that right." So, I mean, he really he really was an amazing, amazing. Well, tell me about Melody, because you were able to spend time with Melody. Well, Melody is 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 amazing, and and she carries on the the ministry. Yeah. Um, you know, Keith died in a plane crash in the early 80s and right. when he was at the height of his career. Yeah. And so while he was impacting the masses um, and his ministry was huge for, for that time, things came to a real standstill and his wife just really carried the ball and just you know kept moving. And so she invited me to come to her, spend a couple of days in her home. And, and just sit with her. And she's really big into carrying the heart of worship, just like mm. Keith was, and encouraging people to really search their hearts and find out why they're doing what right. they're doing. He had such a heart for God and for people. But at the same time, if somebody walked up, and which this happened more than once, they wanted to talk to Keith about God or Jesus. I mean, we literally said to talk to him for a while, then he'd say, hey, I got to leave. I'm in Albuquerque tomorrow. What are you doing? You want to come? And we'd put people on our bus and take them with us. And some of the people we took home, home with us or brought to the ministry with us, or we drop them off at some place and give them bus money to get back. I mean, we always had time. And you have to love people. They're not just an audience.
Are you doing your calling just because it feeds your ego somehow, you know, yeah, and or because it. you we want to look good or whatever, or are you just willing to serve Jesus in whatever He's called you to do and do it to the best of your ability? And, you, and that's and that's good rules to live by, even if you're not in music. I mean, what is your motivation? Yeah, I want to talk about this guy who is one of my favorites. I, I remember being mesmerized by uh, Phil Keggy and how well he could play the guitar and all that he was doing. So tell me about Phil. Well, Phil is a legend today, yeah, as started. well as, as back then, and he really is amazing. The cool thing about Phil is that he's actually, uh, he's missing a finger. Right. And so on film, he shared a little bit about the story of how that happened to him as a kid. I lost my middle finger on a water pump accident. Where, you know, one of those kind of pumps, you, you, you crank the big handle and it's big iron pump and the water comes out the spout. And I, I, I think as a kid, missing a finger was something that was a, a conscious thing that I was dealing with, you know. Kids look, they, they wonder, you know, what happened to you? And I was a little embarrassed, so it was odd, odd because I was going to be in front of people the rest of my life playing. But what happened was, around the time I was born again, I just said, Lord, thank you for the other nine fingers I have. And I want to make these hands um, to be a blessing to you and to, to your people. Uh, and so actually what, what happened was, uh, I accepted that little small, um, what you call a blemish or whatever it might be, I never looked at it as a handicap because I was just so into gu guitar and playing and learning how to sing that um, when I became a Christian, I just dove more into music and more into spirituality and more into finding out what God says in His Word. And, and uh, it gave me encouragement and I just became more confident. I think one of the earliest challenges I had was feeling uh, a sense of competence and um, um, that I could actually fulfill the dreams you know, or see my dreams fulfilled as a musician. I think music is a very spiritual thing. <clears throat> I think it's uh, in, in the idea of melody and uh, what's communicated through the vibrations of strings and uh, it reaches the heart strings. It's like there's a resonance, resonance that takes place. And I do believe that uh, there's music that God inspires that I think uh, you can't really define what it is, but you feel it, you know. God has used his music in a powerful way. An amazing man. Dennis Jernigan, tell me about Dennis. Well, Dennis has an amazing story. He uh, really started his career more in the 80s, and but I, I put him with this group because of how foundational I believe he was for the worship movement. Uh, he wrote songs like You Are My All in All and We Will Worship the Lamb of Glory that really helped influence Christian music as well. And his whole story was that he came out of a homosexual lifestyle and God radically saved him and actually touched him at a second chapter of Acts concert and uh, began to give him songs. And so now he's married, has nine children, and I got to spend, I got to be really uh, connected with both he and his wife and their home in Oklahoma. Mm. And they're just really precious people. And again, they really challenge people, just do what God has called you to do. Don't worry about what other people are saying or the pressures of what the industry may or may not want you to do. Just go after God and release that pure, authentic stream of what God's called you to do. Yeah, amen. Okay, one of one that was extremely popular that I remember was this lady, Honey Tree. Anybody that knew anything of Christian music during that time, it was Honey Tree was, was way up there. Yeah. Talk about who she was. Oh, so she was a, a self-proclaimed hippie of that generation and just got radically uh, touched by the Lord. And so she would write songs with her guitar and just sing in coffee shops. And pretty soon, you know, she was signed to a label and began to touch people around the world with her music. And just, again, that just simple, authentic faith. 
um, that she would just write songs to minister to people. And, and even um, after the Jesus movement, she's done things like she's learned to sing her songs in different Arabic languages. Oh, wow. And in Spanish. And so that she can minister uh, to people uh, in the nations. So again, you see this kind of uh, depth in these people that they really were ministers. They yeah. weren't just, oh, I'm just going to, you know, sing and be on stage with a microphone. Like they had a passion for the gospel and they invested their time into getting the word out. So, so much of these people, and you said it, this really were, they were a part of the Jesus movement and what was happening there. And there are so many lessons that we've talked about even on this program about things the church did right, things the church did wrong about the Jesus movement. I want to hear what's your take on it. When you look back through the eyes of these, all of these artists that you've, you've seen and met with, what, what stands out to you about it? Mm, well, we certainly don't want to idolize anyone or any certain time of history. But at the same time, we can look back and see what God was doing. Right. And humans are messy people. Yeah. And, and so yeah. sometimes even when God is showing up, that doesn't mean that everything looks perfect. <laughs> yeah. But what it does mean is that God is showing up. And I think we can see the fruit of, of what he does uh, through faithful people who even through their flaws and through their cracks, they just say, God, use me. Yeah. And I think that's what we see with these people. Yeah. Uh, what about this man who is really one of the founding fathers is uh, Paul Clark, Jesus Movement. Tell me about him. Yeah, Paul is super fun. I went to interview him because he was my dad's favorite singer. Ah. And uh, my dad had a head injury from a car accident and um, walked with a limp, but we decided that we wanted him to be a part of the interview when we went to Paul's house. So he just invited me to his home in Kansas City. So my dad and my brother and I decided to do a road trip. Okay. And one of our favorite memories is sitting in Paul's home with my dad and um Paul just said, here, let me play your dad's favorite song. And he and my dad are singing this song yeah. from the 1970s. Yeah. It's just this beautiful moment. And my dad has passed away now, but we have that. Oh, and so you were able special, to have, oh, how special, special is moment. that? But yeah, Paul has just influenced incredible amounts of people. He did music for Derek Prince in the right. early days and uh, later went on to have his own solo career. It has just been around the world uh, and just been really faithful to continue for decades and it continues even today to spread the gospel through music. Yeah. Well, that was special that your father got to be there. Yeah. Chuck Gerard. If you knew anything about Christian music during that, Chuck Gerard was in the right there in the middle of it. So tell me about him. Yeah, well, he really was part of the jump start of this whole movement, mm -hmm. I would say. He's one of the real fathers of, of contemporary Christian music and that whole revivalist music movement that was going on at that time. So he would have started in, in California uh, with Calvary Chapel. And uh, the pastor, Chuck Smith, had actually connected with them. And they said, we want to sing our songs. And so Pastor Chuck invited them into his, his studio back in the day or back into his office. And uh, he's like, yeah, I really like your music. Can you come and sing you know, Sunday evening or whenever one of the next meetings were. And they said, well, you know, our, our guitarist is getting out of jail on bail that morning. <laughs> so hopefully we'll be able to do it. And yeah. so, but it worked. They all turned up. And, and, wow. and that's how they started their career was just, yeah. you know, we just all got saved and we're just all hippies, but we're going to sing for the Lord now. And so that just became a huge, nobody knew at that time right. the momentum that it would it would create. Build. Yeah. And you know, I, I hadn't really thought of that until you said it, you know, th there was no growing up in the church and being on the worship team and then going out, you know, like there is today, you know, with a lot of churches recognize that back then it was really the piano and the organ. And if you need something more than that, then you need to check your motives. I mean, in church, that's just the way it was. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds I mean, silly now, but I mean, and, and it was, but I mean, these guys, they had to come from a, a radical background of getting saved and having a real encounter with you. And that's what made them so believable because they had had a counter with Jesus. Right. Because they went from the culture, which was, yeah. there was so much upheaval, so many political things that were going on and they were right in the thick of it. And then all of a sudden, boom, from darkness to light, yeah, they were all about encountering Jesus. So it did make it very believable. Yeah. Amen. All right. So anything... I, we have just, listen, folks, we just skimmed over the top. Anything you want to add about the Jesus movement, what you've learned, and these guys as well? I think it was inspiring to see their passion 
and how this was a revival that didn't just go on for a couple of years and then peter out. Like these, this revival bursts some key people whose momentum carried through generations and is impacting us today. Yeah. Like what you said before this movement, it was all hymns in the churches yeah. and with a piano or an organ. Yeah. And there was no worship movement. And so what they brought is something we're continuing to enjoy today. Right. And it looks a little bit different, but everybody who's doing music now is all standing on their shoulders. That's right. So for me, That's it was right. a way to go honor the fathers and mothers, which scripture talks about, and also to capture what they carry uh, yeah, so that somebody else great. can pick this up and go, oh, I want to be inspired by by some of the genuineness that they carry. The other thing, just one more thing that I noticed with these guys was that what they carried and was able, the wisdom that they carried was not just something that worked in the 70s. Mm -hmm. You know, when, right. when you're That's laboring right. for the Lord and that you carry a maturity, that applies to anyone anywhere who also wants to follow the Lord. So it really felt down like I was sitting, felt like I was sitting down with some apostles and prophets right. and just saying, hey, will you just speak into my life yeah. and the lives of the next gen and capturing that on film? Yeah, that's great. Well, listen, that's exactly what she did uh, with this uh, DVD, Pioneers. And they can get this on your website, right? Yeah, RebeccaFreelander.com. Listen, you, all, you guys, you really should get this. You know, if it's not you, you don't know anything about it, your grandparents may have known about it, uh, or your parents. Listen, this is great. And what do you, you go into a lot more, obviously a lot more depth in these. You, you went to their homes and you did a lot of interviews. And if you could say, what, what was your final takeaway? When you look back on this project that you did, what was your final takeaway from that? Oh, inheritance. Hmm. It's a rich inheritance from revivalists who witnessed a move of God and are still with us on earth today yeah. and can impart to us. So it really doesn't matter if you're a musical artist or not. Right. What they share is something that anybody can apply to their yeah. own life. And Amen. really, I mean, you think about revivals and be like, oh, I wish I could talk to somebody who is from, well, we can. Yeah. And, and this is one way that we can access some of the wisdom that they carry. Good. All right, Rebecca, I'm going to ask you to pray for people because I really think there are those out there that maybe even their kids or grandkids that are, are wanting, you know, to move into music and they need to know. Um, but really you're talking about igniting the passion of Christ within you. And that's really what is, but would you pray for the folks and just look at this camera right here and, and pray for them. Sure. Well, Father God, I thank you that you have put passion inside your people, God. And your anointing is always pouring out in different ways. It may not look like the wineskin of one generation, but you are always calling us to focus on the principles, to keep the vision and the calling you placed in our life pure and clean and ready for you to use us. And so God, I pray that there'd be yes. a quickening on everyone who hears this prayer, that you would so anoint and stir up the gifts and callings that you place inside of them and give them the passion to be uh, discipled and mentored so that they can run um, and, and finish the race well that you've called everyone to finish. Thank you and praise you for your glory, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. So glad you're here. All right, listen, don't forget, RevivalRadioTV.com. Watch any of our past episodes. You can watch that and find out more about how you can be the one. We'll see you next time.